You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Soul Economy and Waldorf Education. It is Collected Works, volume number 303, and is translated by Roland Everett. This is Lecture 10 given in Dornach on the 1st of January, 1922. When the child has completed the ninth year, there follows an important moment in its development. In order to appreciate the significant change taking place during the ninth to the tenth year, one has to remember that the child's inborn feeling for authority, which began with the change of teeth, was of a general undifferentiated kind. The child accepted the dictates of authority as a matter of course, and it felt an inner need to conform to them, without being, as yet, aware of the individual character of the adults concerned. With the completion of the ninth year, however, the child wants to experience an inner justification for authority. Do not misunderstand my meaning. The child would never inwardly reason about whether authority is justified or not, Yet something emerges in its soul, seeking assurance that the authority of the grown-up will stand the test of quality, that it is properly founded in life and that it carries an inner certainty. At this time of life, the child has an acute awareness for these qualities, and this awareness manifests itself in a subtle yet quite objective change in its soul condition. Any sound education must take cognizance of this change and act accordingly. Up to this point in time, the child was unable to discriminate fully between self and surroundings, for the world and self were experienced as one unity. When trying to characterize such matters, one sometimes has to make rather radical statements, and I must ask you to accept such a statement with the right attitude. For instance, if I say that before the ninth year the child does not yet make a proper distinction between humans, animals, plants, and stones, and that everything surrounding it appears to be alive in a general kind of way, it would be completely wrong or to declare dogmatically that the child could not appreciate the difference between a human being and a lily. And yet, in a certain respect, my statement is correct. A real art of education will know how to appreciate the meaning of such apparently radical statements without turning them into dogmas. Life itself shows us everywhere that there are no sharp and rigid contours, so popular among pedantic minds. The end of the ninth year is also the end of a characteristic feature which has frequently been misinterpreted by child psychologists. For example, When a child accidentally knocks itself against a table, it will hit back at it. This has been explained by them as the child's, in quotes, personifying the table. According to child psychology, the child endows an inanimate object with a living soul, which it wants to punish. But this interpretation shows only a superficial understanding of the child's feelings. In reality, the child does not personify the table at all, But the fact is that it has not yet learned to discriminate between an inanimate object and a living being. The child responds to the situation in this way because it cannot yet separate itself from its environment. Toward the end of the ninth year, whole ranges of questions come up in the child's soul, which all arise from a new feeling of differentiation between the self and the outer world and also from a feeling of separateness from the person of the teacher. It is this new way of confronting the world which makes this age into such a turning point in the child's development. Up till now the child was hardly aware of whether the teacher was a clumsy sort of fellow who would knock against desks or tables, or who dropped pieces of blackboard chalk on the floor. It would not have occurred to the child under nine to react to a certain situation, as once did a congregation during a church service. 
for the preacher had the habit of touching his nose every time he had completed a sentence of his sermon, and this habit caused ripples of laughter in church. True, the child would notice such an idiosyncrasy already before the completion of the ninth year, but it would pass by without making a deeper impression. It would be wrong to think that the child does not notice such things, but after the ninth year it becomes acutely aware of them. Already one or two years later, in the tenth and eleventh year, the child will pay far less attention to such matters. But what at this particular time is observed so keenly becomes wrapped up in an entire system of inner questions which burden its soul. These questions may never be voiced, but they are there nonetheless. The child wonders whether the teacher is skillful in all matters pertaining to life, whether he knows what he wants, and, above all, whether he or she is firmly rooted in life. The child has a sensitive perception for the general background of a teacher's personality. Consequently, a teacher who is a skeptic will make a totally different impression from one who is a genuine believer, no matter what words he or she may be speaking. These are the kind of things that are a a real concern to a child between the ninth and tenth year. Here, many individual features of the adult play an important part. An orthodox Protestant teacher will arouse an entirely different impression in the child from a Catholic one, simply because of the differences of their soul situation. Here, other factors need also to be considered, such as the fact that this turning point manifests itself at varying ages according to race and nationality, that is, earlier in one nationality and later in another. In each individual case, this change may appear now earlier, now later, so that all forms of generalizations could be misleading. All one can say is that it is up, it is up to the teacher to perceive this subtle change in the child's soul. As in so many other aspects of education, Here a great deal depends on the teacher's penetrating and objective observation of all the pupils in his class. This latter aspect is of special importance to us in the Waldorf School. In our regular teachers' meetings, we discuss every single pupil, and we try to learn as much as we can through each child's individuality. Naturally, if our numbers continue to grow, we may have to make other arrangements but it is certainly possible to learn a great deal in these meetings, especially if one endeavors to study the more hidden aspects of the growing human being. And here one can make rather surprising discoveries. For example, for a time I made careful observations in our co-educational school regarding the effects of whether boys or girls were in the majority in the various classes or whether their numbers were more or less balanced leaving aside more obvious features resulting from the general class life of the pupils, features which could be explained rationally, I found that classes where the girls were in the majority had an altogether different quality from others where there were more boys than girls. Here the imponderables are very much at work in the social sphere. However, it would be very wrong to draw the most convenient conclusion from what has been said by suggesting the abolition of co-education. Such a retrograde step would merely increase the problems of life. The only answer is to learn how to deal with the problems posed by the majority or minority of boys or girls in the various classes. The way in which a teacher is able to observe each individual pupil, as well as the class as a whole, is always of great importance. Here, deeply philosophical questions arise. For example, in the Waldorf School we have observed that teachers made the best progress if they were able to relate themselves in the right way to the lessons they were giving, and also that with the passing of time their way of teaching had to change. Here again, unconscious and subconscious elements play their dominant part. From all that has been said so far, You will have seen that at this crucial point the child will approach the teacher with all kinds of inner questions. Neither the content of these questions nor the answers given to them matter as much as a certain inner awareness which gradually dawns upon the child's soul. 
This awareness springs from an indefinable element which at this particular time has to develop between the teacher as the guide and the pupil. This is what the pupil feels. Quote, up till now I have always looked up to my teacher. Now I can no longer do so, unless I know that he too looks up to something higher than himself, to something which is safely rooted in life. Close quote. Specially inquisitive children will even pursue their teacher out of school time, noticing well what he does outside school. Everything depends on the teacher recognizing the significance of this stage and on his realizing that the child's tender approach is now longing for renewed confidence and trust. And the way in which a teacher responds to this situation may be a decisive factor for the child's entire life. Whether it will grow up into an unstable character or into a person strongly integrated in life may well depend on whether the teacher is acting with inner certainty and understanding during this crucial time. If we realize the importance of the teacher's conduct and response during the child's ninth to tenth year, we may well wonder in what way the human being is dependent on his environment. However, light cannot be shed upon this important question unless we include in our deliberations other fundamental factors deeply linked with a person's destiny or karma, questions which will occupy us more toward the end of this conference. Nevertheless, what has been stated here is absolutely relevant and true for any serious discussions on education. What matters is that at this moment in life the child can find someone, whether this be one person or possibly several persons is of less importance, whose picture it can carry through life. Only few people are able to observe a phenomenon of life which I should like to describe to you. During certain periods in a person's life, the effects of childhood experiences will surface again and again, and the images springing from this particular turning point are of the greatest importance. Whether they emerge only dimly in later life, whether in dreams or in the waking state, whether they are viewed with feelings of sympathy or antipathy, all this is of great importance. Not the sympathy or antipathy in itself, but the fact that something passed through the child's soul, which in one case evoked sympathy and in another case antipathy. I am not implying that these reminiscences arising from the turning point during the ninth to tenth year are experienced in clear consciousness. In some cases they remain almost completely hidden within the subconscious, but nevertheless they are bound to occur. People who have vivid dreams may see at regular intervals a certain scene or perhaps even the personality, the guide himself who came to his aid in childhood, helping, admonishing, reassuring and awakening a personal relationship with them. This is the kind of soul experience which everyone needs to have met between the ninth and tenth year. It is all part of the objective change taking place in the child which previously was not yet able to distinguish itself from its surroundings, and which now feels the need to find its own identity, to become a separate individuality, able to confront the outer world. From what has been said it follows that the subject matter to be taught at this age must also be adapted to this particular period in the child's development. Especially in our present times, it will become more and more necessary to deal with all educational matters out of real insight into the human being. Just think for a moment of how many children, after their change of teeth, have the possibility of seeing all kinds of machines at work, such as railway engines, tram cars, and so on. Here I can speak out of personal experience, for as a young child I grew up in a small railway station where, every day, I could watch countless trains passing by. And I must state quite categorically that the worst possible thing for a child before the end of the ninth year is to gain a mechanical understanding of a locomotive, a tram, or any other mechanical contrivance. That such matters can affect the entire constitution, right down to the physical body, you will understand 
if you observe other related phenomena of life. For example, you need only think of what it means to the life experience of several generations if a whole nation adopts a new language. Why, for instance, do the Bulgarians appear a Slavonic people? According to their racial origin, they are not Slavs at all. For by race they belong to the family of the Finns, of the Huns. According to their race, they belong to the Mongolian Tartar stream. But early on in their history they adopted a Slavonic idiom, and because of it they gradually changed into a Slavonic nation. All that they imbibed with their new language and with their new culture penetrated their entire inner being. I have met people who considered the Bulgarian element as one of the purest of all the Slavonic elements, which, from the anthropological point of view, it certainly is not. All too often one fails to realize the potent effects of soul and spiritual influences upon the children's entire constitution, working right down into their physical organization. And so, I have to make a rather drastic remark. After the change of teeth, a child would experience a conceptual method of thinking as if spikes were being driven through its whole being especially if such concepts came from the inorganic or lifeless realm. Anything taken from the soulless realm in itself will estrange the child. Therefore those whose task it is to teach children of this age need an artistic ability of imbuing everything they bring with life. Everything must live. The teacher must let the plants speak. He or she must let the animals act as moral beings. The teacher must be able to turn the whole world into a fairy tale, into fables and legends. And in this context, something else of great significance also must be taken into account. What would an easy-going teacher do when faced with such a pedagogical challenge? Most likely he would go to libraries to find books containing legends, animal stories, and other kindred subjects. These he or she would read up for use in the classroom. Of course, sometimes one has to make do with second-best arrangements, but this method is far from ideal. The ideal would be for the teacher to have prepared himself so well for his task, and this kind of approach does need very thorough preparation, that a conversation between plants or a fairy tale about the lily and the rose will come to the children as his own creation. Ideally, such a conversation between the sun and the moon should be the product of the teacher's individual imagination. And why should this be so? Let me answer in a picture. If one tells pupils what one has found in books, however lively one may be as a person, if one tells them what one has read and possibly even memorized, one talks to them like a dry and desiccated individual. It is as if one did not have a living skin, but were covered with parchment instead. For there always remain death-like traces in one's own being of what was thus learned from the past. If, on the other hand, a teacher is creative in his work, his content will radiate growing forces, it will be fresh and alive, and this is what feeds the souls of the children. There has to be a creative urge to clothe the world of plants and animals, of sun and moon, into living stories, if the teacher wishes to reach children of this age. And when, having engrossed himself in such imaginative work, which demands a great deal of inner effort, he hurries to school, his steps already betraying his eagerness to share his offering with his class, the effects of his endeavor will doubtlessly be wholesome for all the children. Such a teacher knows only too well that his story will remain incomplete until he has seen the radiant faces of his young listeners. Up to the end of the ninth year, everything the child learns about plants, animals and stones, about sun, moon and stars or clouds, mountains and rivers, should be clothed in such a picture form where the child feels at one with the world. In those young days, child and world are one united whole. But with the arrival of the great change, a new situation arises. 
The child now begins to experience itself as a self-contained being. It learns to distinguish itself from the surroundings, and this offers a new possibility, indeed the necessity, of introducing the child to the world in new terms. Now, the teaching should bring out the fundamental difference between the plant world and that of the animals, for the child needs to be introduced to these two kingdoms of nature, each in its own different way. It is certainly possible to introduce children in their tenth to twelfth years to the plant and animal kingdoms, but each of these two subjects should be taken from a different point of view. To introduce pupils of this age to a plant by showing them a specimen pulled out of the earth as if it were complete in itself is really a dreadful thing to do. Right from the start there ought to be a feeling that a single plant torn out of the earth, not unlike a human hair pulled out of the body, does not represent a reality. It could never exist on its own. Likewise, once it has been pulled out of the earth, the plant cannot exist independently. The plant belongs to the surface of the earth as the human hair belongs to the head. Plant and earth belong together. We shall see in a moment that something else is needed here. But to begin with, we awaken in the children a feeling of how plant and earth belong together. We let them experience how in the root the plant is more earth-like, the root adapting itself to the varying nature of the soil. Such an observation, however, must never be abstract, nor should it be simply taught as a fact. But the pupils should gradually develop a feeling of how, for instance, the roots are different in dry or in wet soil, or whether they grow close to towering rocks or near to the sea. First of all, the child has to learn to look upon the plant as belonging to the earth's soul, and upon all sprouting vegetation as a rising up out of the soil. Then one has to develop a feeling in the children for the contrasting nature of earth-like root and the blossom and fruit which are closely allied to the sun. When speaking about blossom and fruit, one has to lead the children from the earth sphere to the sun sphere. The pupil ought to gain a feeling of how the blossom unfolds in the warmth and light of the sun's rays, and how in blossom and fruit the plant is becoming emancipated from the fetters of the earth. Earth, plant, growth, and influence of the sun all have to be looked upon as being part of a complete whole. I should even like to say that the child's idea of the plant should be so steeped in feeling that were one to talk about it without referring both to the earth as a whole and to the sun, the child should inwardly experience a twinge of pain, not unlike one caused by seeing a plant being torn from its earthly home. Here again we must not look upon the subject to be taught merely in the abstract, but we ought also to consider its social implications. Only think of what it means for the development of our civilization that a large proportion of our population is now living in urban surroundings, with the effect, and people who have left the countryside to live in towns will confirm this, that generations of city children have grown up who are unable to distinguish wheat from rye. Although this may sound grotesque, in my opinion, a person who has not learned to distinguish rye from wheat cannot be considered a full human being. I would even go as far as saying that a city dweller who knows the difference between these two grains only through handling them still does not attain to the ideal. Only he who has stood on the very soil on which rye and wheat were growing and who has learned to recognize them there on the spot has made the right interconnection with those two plants. As teachers, we should avoid collecting specimens on our own in order to show them to our pupils in the classroom. It would be far better to take the children out into nature so that there in the real and living situation of earth, sun, and weather conditions they may gain an understanding of plant life. This would also give us an opportunity of showing them something else of importance, namely what a potato really is. For the potato is not part of the root, as it may appear, but in reality is a bulbous stem. The dry soil on which the potato plant grows 
draws back into the earth what really belongs to the green leaves and stems. Looking at these green parts of a plant, one should be able to recognize to what extent the plant's growth is governed by the forces of the earth and in how far the soil makes its impulse felt in the plant. One ought to be able to experience how, in the case of the potato, the stalks demean themselves by creeping under the dry ground. And again, one ought to have an eye for how the moist meadowland and the slanting rays of the autumn sun create the lilac-colored cups of colchicum, colchicum autum, autumnala, the autumn crocus. Readers aside, please forgive my pronunciation. I'll try that again. Colchicum autumnala. End of readers aside. If we thus present a picture of how the plant grows out of the earth as out of a living organism, showing how it adapts itself to the varying kinds of soil, to different climates and other influences, we can easily find a transition to geography. Other aspects of this subject will fit into the picture quite naturally. And yet when talking about the earth, what kind of picture is usually presented nowadays? So often the earth's green mantle, the plant world, is completely left out of account. People talk as if the earth were nothing but a globe moving in outer space, controlled by the laws of gravity, which explain the mutual effects between heavenly bodies. It is as if this mathematical, mechanical aspect were all that mattered. But who has the right to isolate the mathematical and mechanical laws of gravity affecting the earth from what belongs to it so intimately, namely the growing plant? When talking about the earth as a sphere moving through the universe, one ought to pay at least equally much attention to what the earth contributes to the plant in its root, as we do to the purely mathematical and mechanical relationships resulting from gravitation and so on. It is important to let all lessons be pervaded by the fullness of life. Now, just as we related the plant world to the surface of the earth, so when introducing animal study, should we link the animals to the human being? When calling forth ideas about the plant world, in the way I have indicated, the teacher will notice that all kinds of questions as to the why and wherefore of the world will come up in class conversations. It is really much healthier if such questions of causality come up during the study of the plant than if they are brought about by mechanical concepts or through the study of lifeless minerals. And just as we should allow a feeling for causality to develop through the study of the plant, so it is right to introduce the study of animals by comparing them with the human being, an analogy which will remain valid throughout the pupils' lives. In order to facilitate a clear understanding of the principles underlying the introduction to the study of animals, I should like to pass on to you certain ideas far too often ignored nowadays, which, however, are definitely addressed to the adult world and which would have to be specially adapted for use in the classrooms of pupils aged 10 to 12. If we look at the human being from a morphological and physiological point of view, we see that the head in its outer appearance is rounded off and roughly spherical. Within it there is the gray matter of the brain, which is only slightly differentiated from cellular ganglia, and deeper within there is the fibrous white matter. Now, is it possible to find an analogy to the formation of the human head in the animal world? And if so, where do we find it? We have to look for it among the lowest grades of the animal kingdom. The human head is, of course, a highly complex organ, but its most characteristic feature consists in that a soft mass within its inclo- within is enclosed by a hard outer shell. And this fundamental feature can be found, though in a primitive state, among the lower animals. Anyone willing to look at nature without prejudice will recognize in the crustaceans the principle of the human head in its most primitive form, and consequently will relate the human head to the shellfish. From this point of view, an oyster resembles the human head far more than an ape. If you look at any of the soft-bodied animals encased within a hard shell, 
you have before you the simplest form of the human head. If we now move on to the human chest system, to that part of our body which mainly comes under the influence of the spine, we are led to higher animals, for example the fish. And how is the fish constituted? In the case of the fish, the head is hardly more than a continuation of the spine, despite the fact that the head is more differentiated. The entire fish is a spine creature. And if we look upon the organization of the fish as a creature belonging to the middle group of the animal kingdom, we have to compare it with the human lymph organization, with man's middle system. If we look at at yet higher animals, the mammals, we cannot but compare what they have developed to a specially high degree to the human metabolism and limb system. Take the lion or the camel. Their entire being is dominated by the specially developed organization of limbs and metabolism. Looking at the animal kingdom from this point of view, a remarkable relationship emerges between the three animal groups and the human organization. Number one, organization of the head, lower animals. Organization of the rhythmic system, intermediary animals. Organization of the metabolism and limbs, higher animals. Such an approach gives us also a real insight into the evolution of man and animal. Human development began with something which finally emerged as the head. But this happened during very ancient times, when outer conditions of the earth were entirely different from what they are today. There was as yet plenty of time and opportunity for these early stages, which, oyster-like, were depending on impulses coming from their surroundings, to develop into what has become the present head. Now the head, parasite-like, sits on top of the remaining organism from which it draws what the oyster still draws from its environment. During the course of evolution man replaced external earthly surroundings by developing the head as part of the human organism. One can follow this development if one looks at human embryology which shows that with regard to his head organization, man has undergone a long evolution. The head organization began at a time which is still represented by today's mollusks. Today's mollusks, however, are late arrivals in evolution. As they now have to develop under less favorable outer conditions, they cannot achieve the density of the human head, but have to remain at the stage of a soft-bodied animal surrounded by a hard shell. In today's completely different external conditions, they still represent early stages of man's head organization. The organization of the fish, on the other hand, occurred during a later period of earth evolution than that of man, and it already met different outer conditions. At that time, man had already reached a stage when he could draw from his own rhythmic system impulses which the fish still had to draw from its surroundings. The organization of the intermediate animal group was added to that of the evolving human being who, by that time, had reached a certain stage of development. And finally, when man had already begun to develop his limb and metabolic system in its present sense, when his metabolism had become differentiated, leaving only a residue in the head and chest organization, the higher animals began to appear on the earth. This point of view will enable you to understand that the current theory of man's descent is correct, but only with regard to the head. For the head does stem from forebears who had a remote resemblance to the lowest animals of today. And yet, these forebears were again quite different from our present-day crustaceans because these latter creatures have to exist under such different external conditions. Regarding the organization of his middle system, man is descended from forebears who quite definitely were already on the way toward becoming human, and who, regarding their physical organization, resembled the fish. However, the fish species itself arrived too late, and consequently it had no longer enough time to develop the head fully, especially since the fish was restricted to living in the watery element. 
In this way, we obtain a theory of man's descent which is in accordance with reality. On the other hand, if one does not take into consideration man's threefold organization, one can reach only a one-sided theory, which, however ingenious it may be, simply does not stand up to a thorough and searching investigation. And so we can say, in the ascending order of today's animal species, we can recognize the one-sided development of one particular system of the human organization. The shellfish is a one-sided head animal. The fishes are one-sided chest animals, and the higher mammals have specialized in their development of the metabolic and limb system. We can understand every animal form if we look at each major animal group as having specialized, one-sidedly, in one of the three main systems of man's bodily organization. At the turn of the 18th to 19th century, there were still some people who had a natural feeling for such ideas. But as there was not sufficient knowledge to work them out thoroughly and realistically at that particular time, only the underlying feelings were correct. Oaken, readers aside, spelled O-K-E-N, end of readers aside, Oaken, one of the German nature philosophers, now held much in contempt, but who nevertheless was a very ingenious personality, once made a grotesque-sounding statement. It is, of course, all too easy to ridicule it today, but it was made out of a certain right feeling. Oaken declared that the human tongue was an octopus. Well, the human tongue is definitely not an octopus. It is easy enough to make this judgment. But behind Oaken's statement, there was a general feeling that one has to look at the lower animals if one wants to gain an understanding of the various forms of the organs in the human head. What I have told you was given for your information, but it is quite possible to present these ideas so that children can also understand them, for children are receptive to the morphological approach to the human being. One can study the various human forms and then find the appropriate analogy to forms in the animal world. In this way, it is definitely possible to awaken in children the feeling that the entire animal kingdom is like a human being, spread out into all the manifold animal forms, or that man is the synthesis of the animal kingdom. In this way, the teacher links the animal world to the human being, as the plant world was related to the earth. Introducing each of these two subjects according to its own individual character we shall awaken a healthy feeling for the world when, after the age of nine, the child has learned to appreciate the distinction between inner self and outer world. The aim is not so much that the pupils should accumulate a great deal of knowledge, but that we prepare the ground for them to acquire the right feeling for the world. Just think of the kind of things which are done in the name of education, not only as far as pupils are concerned, but also with regard to the training of teachers. Quite dreadful things are happening in teacher training centers, where, in order to pass their exams, candidates are often expected to carry an unnecessary burden of factual knowledge in their heads. In most instances, examination questions demand the kind of knowledge which could be looked up equally well in an encyclopedia. Such memorized facts are of little real value. What is important is that the examiners gain the conviction of a candidate's suitability for the teaching profession, because he or she is capable of teaching out of a real knowledge of man. The question of memory and our attitude toward its development in children is another point of great importance. We must not forget that up to the change of teeth, memory, or the ability to remember, is directly linked to the child's organic development. What a child of that age remembers so easily is brought about by forces which are working at the same time in the process of nutrition and growth. Up to the change of teeth, the child's soul, spiritual, and its physical forces are simply one unity. Therefore, we could make the greatest mistakes if by artificial means we were to try to strengthen the child's memory before it has shed its teeth. We must be clear that before the change of teeth, the child is an imitator. 
also with regard to the development of its memory. This means that if we behave rightly in its presence, the child will develop its memory according to its predisposition toward physical growth and nutrition. Physical care, of which we shall have to speak later on, and the child's hygiene are the best means for cultivating the child's memory forces. One of the characteristic traits of our materialistic age is that people try to interfere with the young child's natural development by using artificial educational means. Appealing to the child's soul and spiritual element, they want to train its memory already before the seventh year. Some of them even want to go further, which only goes to show how out of touch with reality a materialistic attitude can be. There are mothers, and here I speak from personal experience, who not only ask how they should teach their children before the age of teeth, excuse me, before the change of teeth, in a manner befitting only a later age, but who even go as far as asking how one should educate a child before it is born. They ask how the embryo should be educated. All one can say in answer is, let the mother look after herself and her conduct. If she lives healthily and treats herself rightly, the child will develop in a healthy way. Its growth will have to be left to the Creator. This may be rather a radical way of putting it, but it is nevertheless a justifiable one in view of the sophisticated questions about educational principles which really belong to an older age. On the other hand, we must be clear that with the change of teeth, the soul and spiritual part of the child becomes emancipated from the physical to such an extent that now is the right time for us to plan educational principles which are to aid the child's faculty of remembering. But this faculty too becomes emancipated at this stage. When the child reaches school age, it is right to do something about strengthening its memory, but this needs to be done according to a definite plan. If one burdens the child's memory, that is, if one tries to strengthen it by overloading it, the child's faculty of remembering will only be weakened. Such misdirected efforts will encourage a certain rigidity in later life and a proneness toward prejudices which such a person will find hard to overcome. If, on the other hand, memory development is disregarded altogether, a child will be deprived of certain means toward developing physical strength. If, when the child reaches school age, nothing is done to train its memory, the consequences will be a tendency toward inflammatory conditions in adolescence. Such a person will easily suffer from inflammations and be liable to catch colds. Causal links of this kind once again show how one has to consider both the physical and the soul-spiritual aspects together. Therefore, memory development demands a certain tact from the teacher, who must avoid doing too much or too little about it. It would be equally wrong to drill the child's memory excessively as it would be to overlook the question of memory altogether. The answer is neither to damage the child's living interest by enforcing mechanical memorizing, nor to neglect memory building altogether. Let us look at ways of putting these ideas into practice. We can introduce children to the four rules of arithmetic as described in the last lecture. We can give them some understanding of number relationships according to whether we subtract, divide, add, or multiply as shown yesterday. But there is always an opportunity of letting the pupils memorize their tables as long as these are related to the four rules in the right way. This will also help them to deal with more complicated number relationships to be introduced at a later stage. In this respect, it is easy to commit sins by introducing the so-called object lessons. Calculators have been introduced. Footnote. Here, Rudolf Steiner was referring to various forms of the abacus. End of footnote. I do not wish to be fanatical in any way, and the calculator may have its usefulness. From certain points of view, everything in life is justifiable. But much of what can be gained from the use of thought-out calculating machines can equally well be achieved through the use of the ten fingers, 
or, for example, through taking the number of pupils in the class. Do not take it amiss if I tell you that when I see calculators in classrooms, from a spiritual point of view, it strikes me as if I were in a medieval torture chamber. It really is not right to delegate learning processes to mechanical devices simply in order to bypass apparently mechanical memorizing. This is an area where we are facing a specially difficult task in the Waldorf School. I have already told you that we aim at achieving soul economy in our teaching and consequently we believe it to be beneficial for our pupils if we restrict learning to the classrooms. This means that we give the pupils as little homework as possible. This principle is prompted by yet another motive. Certainly one should aim at developing in the child a feeling for duty, of responsibility, and later on we shall speak about how one can try to bring this about. But what is very damaging is if the teacher makes certain demands upon the pupils which they do not fulfill. And homework, as any other learning done at home, is very conducive to this effect. Parents often complain to us that their children are not given enough homework to do. But we have to consider the fact, and this is absolutely clear to anyone with sufficient insight, that too much homework will cause some pupils to be overtaxed, while others will be tempted to produce slipshod work or simply to evade such tasks. Sometimes it is simply beyond the children's abilities to fulfill the teacher's demands. But the worst thing to happen is that children do not carry out what the teacher has told them to do. Therefore it would be better to ask less of them than to risk letting them get away with not fulfilling their set tasks. All expectations and demands regarding the training of memory, as well as those involving homework, need to be dealt with by the teachers very tactfully. The development of the pupil's memory depends especially upon the teacher's sensitive perception, and it is largely due to this quality that the right relationship between the teacher and his class will develop. Tomorrow we shall go into further details about the right attitude toward memory training. The end of Lecture 10